Joining us now to talk about Canada in the 21st century is Irvin Student. He is a professor at the University of Toronto and editor-in-chief and publisher of Global Brief. And that's where we should start because your magazine is now five years young. So congratulations. Thanks, Steve, and thanks for having me again. Not at all. Just for those who haven't read it, what's the magazine's focus and mission? Well, Global Brief, I think, uh, was founded in 2009, and we're a partner with the Glennon School of Public and International Affairs. I'm, however, based at the School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Toronto, and it fills a conspicuous void in the Canadian strategic or policy discourse. That is, every time when I worked in Ottawa, I used to get enervated by deputy ministers putting up in the, in the right hand the economist and the left hand foreign affairs or foreign policy, saying, this is the state of the world, Canada. And no one would uh, venture uh, a question or dare to, to question, why is it that we're outsourcing our imagination or the state of the world as, as, we, as we ought to see it to foreign magazines? Has Canada nothing to offer at a global level to, to frame the debate, as it were? So you're trying to fill that void? We're trying to fill that void. So we're sold in the top stores in 12 countries around the world and, and doing quite well. Do you know if policymakers read it? Uh, they definitely read it they definitely actively. Read it? How do yes. you know? Uh, they, they write to me all the time and they, they critique, they, they applaud, they suggest. Got it. Well, in one of your recent essays, which was the reason we wanted to get you in here, besides to wish you happy fifth anniversary, uh, was a piece that you wrote which will either in the years to come be seen as incredibly prescient or, boy, were you out in left field on that one all by yourself. So let's get into this. You think that the 21st century by the end of it, could feature Canada as the second most important country in the Western world. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a moment here just to lay out the thesis in general and then we'll start to pick it apart. So go ahead. Right. Uh, the thesis is premised on, on, on a number of things, but if you look at population growth to begin with, Canada today is at 35 million. The United States is at uh, 313, 314. Uh, by mid-century to end of century, and of course I was last on your show to speak about Canada at 100 million, by mid to end of century, Canada will have surpassed the largest European countries, um, the largest Western European countries in population alone. Germany, the United Kingdom, France. Uh, so on that, st uh, on that uh, score alone, we will be amongst the big players and second by definition in the West. The second pressure to, to which we'll have to respond is basic strategic changes in the world. Now if I go back and say since the European landing, there's been a war every century on terror North America, including Canada, except for the last. I have to say that since 1867, Canada has had the luckiest strategic century of any country in the world, uh, both across the continents and on our own continent. This will change this century. There are three reasons. One is the decline, the relative decline of American power. Two is the a more porous Arctic border. And three is pure technology, cyber technology, basic military technology. This will exert a great pressure on us. And it will force us, in concert with basic uh, demographic changes, which will up our latent power, to perform or not perform. And if we are performing and b achieving our basic strategic interests at close to 100 million by the end of the century, if we're around, we're going to have to, by definition, be the second player in the West. Let's start to uh, examine some of these in more detail right now. Your population projections, I presume, are based in the fact that we're bringing about a quarter of a million immigrants into Canada annually now, have been for a long time, right. and you see that trend continuing? It, it could probably grow. I mean, there, the, 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 the pressures for intake, not just economic, but in terms of the state of the world, and at some point, perhaps, because we'll want to, to be a, a, a bigger player, will, in my view, be inexorable. There's no push against that. Of course, anything could change. So, mm -hmm. so that, I'm, I'm basing that on, on reasonable constancy, indeed growth at some point. Okay. Speaking of constancy, do we assume that Canada, towards the end of the 21st century, is still a country that includes 10 provinces? Oh, that is that that is the uh, a question that I, I, I won't even uh, dare answer. I, I fancy not. Um, first of all, you've got three territories in the north that at some point will will aspire to to uh, to provincial status. I think the more complicating factor for us in this century, and at some point hopefully we'll speak even on the Quebec question, which is the greatest complicating well, that's my factor. Point. Uh, no, but I think the, the bigger complicating factor uh, in the in the immediate term is the Aboriginal question. 
That is to say, there are huge Aboriginal pressures all over the country. Uh, when we talk about the book, I hope towards the end of the interview, you'll see that these press on us, not just constitutionally, but strategically. And at some point, we'll have to create a more interesting, more eclectic, more even promiscuous uh, constitutional framework. So it's, it's not obvious that we'll be in the same Cartesian 10 province, three territorial uh, formula, but we'll still be much bigger if we're together. But if we, if we're not sure that Quebec is around for the long run, do your population projections need a major revamp if we're saying goodbye to five million people, six million people right away? Right. There, I think Quebec is closer to eight today. Okay. But let's say, uh, let me put it bluntly, I condition my uh, thesis that Canada will be the second country in the West by saying, if we're around. Don't forget that over the last two centuries, states have tended to last about 60 years. Uh, the Soviet Union lasted 70 years. Today, that that Soviet Union is discussed as the Soviet experiment at Queen's University. <laughs> it seemed interminable. Israel has survived almost 70 years. Canada has survived almost, almost 150, 150 years. That's exceptional <clears throat> in, in human history. So it's not obvious that we'll survive this century. We're going to have to work for it. If Quebec goes, we don't survive. The country does not exist in my view. So I, I won't even put that, 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 that uh, conjecture uh, in, into, the, into the mix because once Quebec goes, the whole, uh, the whole experiment unravels. Well, we're, presumably we're not the same Canada, we're a different Canada, but we're still Canada at some point. Aren't I we? don't know who, who, who the we is, Steve, well, I because guess English Canada. we would have to say, I'm not even sure there is an English Canada, because you would have to say if Quebec leaves, uh, which could happen or could not, we're going to have to fight for it. Uh, if Quebec leaves, one, there's no territorial continuity anymore in Canada, and two, the major psychological political question is, Who's going to uh, as, 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 ascribe legitimacy to governments in Ottawa if you look at uh, polls from all the way from Newfoundland to Victoria to Nunavut? Who's going to give, who's going to subordinate to, to a government from Ottawa? Who's going to be able to stitch this pyramid together? Recall that in 1867 it was only four provinces and you required the dyad of Macdonald Cartier through hook and crook to be able to, to, to cunningly put this together. Mm -hmm. If Quebec goes the major territory, the major spiritual force at Confederation, then we're not going to be able to stitch it back together. And to be frank, the Soviet Union's unraveling is our precedent. If Canada uh, is to be the country you see it being by the end of the 21st century, is it possible we will acquire new territory? Uh, it's very possible. Uh, I don't think we need new territory, uh, but it's very possible that we could either uh, get some, some states that would want to um, uh, join us. Um, we could talk about degrees of annexation, not military annexation, political annexation, different types of, of unions. We could lose some territory. We could not lose Quebec. But for me, the more interesting question, Steve, is uh, can we as a country imagine ourselves as the second most important country in the West? Mm -hmm. This is not a, a strategic political question, it's a psychological I'm question. I'm getting to that. Yes. Hold off on that. Yeah. I'm going to get there, but I want to go through the sort of nuts sure. and bolts first. Uh, it doesn't even have to be territory that's contiguous with where we are right now. There was a lot of talk 25 years ago about the Turks and Caicos Islands becoming part of Canada somehow. I think a lot of us these days in January are interested in that <laughs> no proposition. Kidding, no kidding. But is that a realistic uh, something on the horizon for Canada? I don't think it's on the horizon, but it's not impossible that if we begin again when we get to the psychological question, if we begin to think systematically about the country, about its, uh, about its vocation in the world, we might be interested in, in, in outposts around the world and, and they might be interested in us. I think there was discussion when the European Union was, was foundering three or four years ago of, of Canada, please join the European Union. We, we need a stable anchor, and Iceland was the first one to discuss that. How about, I don't know, did you read Diane Francis's book? Which one? Uh, the most recent one in which she suggests that probably a merger, right. if not an outright yes. merger, then at least some kind of confederation like the European Union between Canada and the United States might be our best bet going forward. What are your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, I think this speaks to a deeper psychological problem that, that we have in Canada, is that we, we can't imagine any reality but some sort of deep connection with the United States. It's a very unpromiscuous, uneclectic vision uh, of Canada. It's very colonial, it's very 19th century, and I'm trying to say, let's push it forward. In the 21st century, it will be much more complicated. We're gonna have to anchor with different partners, some of which are less comfortable, some, many of whom are not like us. Uh, and it's not necessarily the United States that is for the good for all transactions. Well, is it part of your thesis that we don't want to 
hook our anchor to a sinking ship? Is that how you see the United States? Oh, the United States is definitely not a a sinking ship. They will be the first country of of the West. They they will be in the top three or four countries in the world. If China is number one, the United States is number one, uh, for our purposes, I'm just suggesting that we would probably be in the the top five, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And the United States is a major asset for us. I'm not sure why we we should say that the best bet is, is, is confederation with the United States. An outsider looking at Canada says, Look at our, all our latent assets. We've got the biggest geography after Russia. We have stable government, largely stable borders, a hugely educated population, natural resources that others historically would kill for. And the only thing missing that in that uh, equation to make us of those major countries is two things, a larger population mm-hmm. and two, the right psychology. Getting there, yeah. hold off, yeah. almost there. Do you see this uh, more muscular Canada having a particular or special role to play vis-a-vis managing American-Chinese relations going forward? This, uh, it's, it, that's, that's a, a perfect question because I think some of the mistakes in Canadian foreign affairs and strategic thinking uh, historically and certainly today are, are that we're obsessed with the means, with the ends. What is Canada going to do? What is Canada? This is a choice for governments. Uh, but all governments can do greater things if they have the basic means, cultural means and machinery means. So this bigger Canada, this mu- more muscular Canada, will be able to, to bridge gaps, maybe b- between China and the United States, I'm not sure whether that's one, but maybe between Russia and Europe, right? Pick a conflict, any conflict, as I used to say. Canada, in theory, if we had a more uh, ambitious, uh, eclectic government, not this one, but any government, uh, could populate the North with about five peace tables. One of them would succeed, the other four would would change. The Nobel Prize would be won by the Prime Minister of the day. That would change the psyche of the country. Today we can't even get a war criminal into the borders. We're so pedantic about about our domestic arrangements. Uh, So these types of of, uh, experiments in peacemaking would be impossible. They're not part of our thinking. You referenced our first Prime Minister a few moments ago, and now let's talk about that psychology that you talked about. Because our founding PM, Sir John A. Macdonald, was quite content to have us be a secondary power to Great Britain, of course, at the time. Today, many Canadians, I suspect, are content to be a secondary power behind the United States. What makes you think our population is either interested in or ready to be this more muscular power you see? I'm pretty sure on the current discourse, and the glorification of that discourse by our political class today that we're definitely not interested or ready for that, which is my great concern. Because as I said at the beginning of our interview, we've had a strategically very lucky 150 years. It will become more difficult. There will be warfare of some manifestation or other on territory North America, including Canada, over the course of the next 100 years. That's been the historical rule both on this continent and across the continent. Where and over what? Well, can we imagine the rise of China over the course of a century, or a much more ambitious, consolidated China over the course of a century without any warfare with a great power? And if it were to be with the United States at some point, uh, many good uh, social uh, scientists and strategists have already written that China will have the capabilities of 10 or 15, within 10 or 15 years to target North American cities. That shouldn't surprise us. It's not that wa- warfare is always going to be a one-way action from North America to a country uh, about which we're little interested. There will be a, re- a reply, a replique at some point. So uh, that's just a, a psychological pressure that will assert itself. If we want to be able to resist it, to achieve basic interests, our basic strategic interests in Canada and abroad, secure our territory, secure our well-being, have a stable uh, country, then we're going to have to play at that level. And so we will be forced, whether we're interested in it or not, at some point to play at that level. The question is, will crisis force our hand, in which case we could lose the whole enchilada, or will the political class at some point say, you know what, uh, it's time to get our act together to prepare for this more serious game, and, and, and there are positive dividends. That is, we can also do great things in the world as a country. Do you see anybody making those plans today on the foreign affairs scene in this country? Zero. Zero. Uh, it's quite the, the reverse. Uh, we're glorifying, we're glorifying uh, passivity, lassitude, mediocrity. Uh, we are uh, in, in, in engaging in rhetoric, which is, which is inexpensive. And at the same time, cutting the basic resources that at some point we're going to have to invest in in order to be a meaningful player. This is okay when the going is good. But when the going is tough, strategically, psychologically, uh, rhetoric won't do it. You need a population that has the muster. And the question again is, 
are we a serious country at that level? But there's no evidence I've seen in 150 years, and admittedly, I'm looking back, not ahead, that suggests that anybody in this country is ready to play the kind of role that you think we either should or may need to play going forward. So where does that leave us? This is a big problem. This is a big problem. Uh, in the Constitution of Canada, uh, which I always get my kids to read at night, um, the preamble... That's, that's verging on child abuse. It's I, I may have to call the authorities on please that. Please don't. Please. <laughs> the, uh, the preamble to the Constitution, you mentioned that we were happy to be a secondary player to, the, to Great Britain. The preamble, uh, to, to, to my shock, and I hope to the shock of the people listening to it, still says the Federation will, quote, conduce to the welfare of the provinces and promote the interests of the British Empire. This means two things. One, we promote the interests of the, of the, uh, promote the welfare of the provinces. We're great at federalism. We're first class in federalism. We produce, pr produce some of the best jurists in the world, second to none in many cases. Uh, promote the interests of the British Empire means we outsource strategy and big ideas to the strategic power of Westminster okay. at the day, were attacked. So this means but you culturally. Know that that's, that's in there because it was in there 150 years ago, and, and we've moved on since then. No, I don't think we've moved on. This gives the basic impulse uh, for our, our psyche today. The question is, has, it, has there been enough pressure on us exerted strategically for us to get out of that box? And, and the point is, over 150 years, we've had such luck mm -hmm. that there hasn't been, with the exception of a few heroes like Pearson, sometimes Trudeau, sometimes Axworthy. Uh, there are a few people here and there, sometimes Arbour. I don't want to denigrate great achievements, but these are uh, achievements in the context of a, a general amateurish context and strategy because our, for, our hand has never been forced to play at a big level. And lucky for us, life is good. Okay, just finally, we've got a new book coming out called The Strategic Constitution, Understanding Canadian Power in the World. Take a minute and tell us what that's about. Well, thanks for the opportunity. It's uh, a new book uh, that's out with UBC Press, and it tries to bridge what are two intellectual policy solitudes in, in Canada. One is the constitutional tradition, our understanding of constitutionalism, which historically, as we discussed, is based on federalism and after the, uh, the charter on, on, on civil rights, and international relations and strategy and, and foreign policy in Canada, which is... Uh, which doesn't understand the Constitution as a bulwark for what we can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. A good example, for instance, is um, uh, education. In Canada, education is viewed as strictly as, as, as a provincial competence. Right? Uh, but when we do foreign affairs, we don't realize that education is the basic bulwark for success or not success. An example is that in 2007, Canada said, and I think rightly, we could be a major player in the Americas. Mm -hmm. That's 2007 Harper. More recently, we've said we're going to pivot to Asia following the American pivot. No one deigned to ask, well, where are all the Spanish speakers? For the Asia pivot, where are all the Asian language speakers? And that's because, obviously, they're formed or not formed in the schools. So if you're going to do good foreign policy, you've got to speak with the provinces who need to change the curricula as necessary for Canada to perform. And that just shows that we do strat strategy naively, we do domestic stuff excellently, but without any thought to strategy. Too parochial. Uh, parochial, uh, uh, we do it excellently, but it's got a different mission. We just don't see it as a system that ought to be connected. And I try to bridge the two uh, for some sort of view of, of, of uh, a basic uh, framework in which we, we can be quite potent in the world. Irvin, I want us to reassemble on this set in 86 years and see how close your predictions came to coming true. Is that a deal? Your, your grandchildren and mine both. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks well for having done. me. Cheers. Irvin Student, University of Toronto, publisher and editor in chief of Global Brief magazine. Thanks so much. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.